Every 11 seconds, there's a new ransomware attack. Oil pipelines, universities, corporations, all paying millions of dollars. Barracuda says, don't pay the ransom. Before a ransomware attack occurs, train your teams to recognize an attack and use anti-phishing technology. Protect your applications and they can't get onto your network. Simple backup and restore solutions quickly recover your data without paying the ransom. Build your ransomware protection plan now by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. Let's face it, cyber attackers have the advantage. Extra Hop is on a mission to help you take it back. Regain the upper hand with security that can't be undermined, outsmarted, or compromised. When you don't have to choose between protecting your business and moving it forward, that's security uncompromised. See how it works in the full product demo, free online at securityweekly.com forward slash extra hop. Cyber risk and compliance automation is finally here. Legacy GRC systems cannot support the powerful, real-time automation and oversight that organizations require to take risks that matter to succeed. CyberSync continuous control automation ingests data from the IT GRC stack to update controls against regulatory requirements and risks in real time, delivering insights and visibility. See how members of the Fortune 500 are saving millions annually by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash CyberSync. Welcome back to Business Security Weekly. I am your host, Matt Alderman, joined by Jason Albuquerque and Ben Carr. Do you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover on one of the shows? Submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests and completing the form. If you send me an email, I'm just going to send you to securityweekly.com forward slash guests. We review suggestions monthly and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. Also, Cyber Risk Alliance's Business Intelligence Unit has launched its next survey on zero trust. What are your barriers to zero trust implementation? Take our survey and enter to win a $500 Tango card by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash zero trust. Report results will be released at our upcoming Zero Trust eSummit in March. All right, gentlemen, uh, let's see. We got articles for the week. We, get, we had a little over a week because we did the show the previous Friday, so we had a little extra time. Now, this first article uh, talks about um, the kind of the cybersecurity, you know, becomes a top agenda in the, in the boardroom. Mm -hmm. And Jason, you could say that this was a prediction. But when you read what he puts here, these aren't predictions. I mean, this is stuff that's happening every single this, day. Like <laughs> This is today. This is, this is current state article. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> no, no doubt about it. I mean, I mean, we know we know that ransomware threats are going to continue to evolve. All cyber threats are going to continue to evolve into 2022 and throughout, um, you know, cybersecurity is a conversation at the boardroom and so many conversations that I'm having, uh, you know, CEOs, board of directors, they're all talking about cybersecurity and, and ultimately business risk. Right. We talked about it in the previous segment. Um, yeah. What I'm seeing a ton of now our customers are coming back saying, I just got dropped from my cyber liability insurance because they did an audit on us. Now, it wasn't like a, uh, you know, a 10 question word document or a, a phone call. They actually did a level of an audit or an assessment against cyber posture and organizations are losing cyber liability insurance. That, I think that was that, the that most is, interesting part out of this article, which is why I left yes. it in here, is because I think the issue around cyber li liability and cyber insurance has shifted dramatically since we saw cyber insurance come on the scene a few years back, where organizations now are losing their coverage. And I think mm -hmm. if, if, I'm, if I'm sitting in a boardroom and I'm sitting in a large enterprise and this is what's happening across the industry... I'm rethinking my cybersecurity strategy going forward. 100%. And that lit the boardroom conversation on fire. On fire. Yeah. And I, I will, I'll argue that within the last six months, it's ramped up heavily. The last yeah, six months has think, been you know, insane. The, 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 the court case recently where they basically said that you couldn't just attribute that to acts of war, right? You had to have specific mm -hmm. exclusions. I think you're going to see changes to policies really ramping up around this, right? I think Lloyd's made yep. changes. I think you know, you're going to see a lot of insurance companies looking to specifically carve stuff out. And in that carve out, there's potentially going to be changes into what your requirements are as part of your due diligence if you want to maintain some type of cyber coverage, mm -hmm. at, even at the elevated prices they're going for. Yep. Yo, oh, yeah. I, I've had customers come back and their insurance organizations have had third-party companies 
do scans of their network for vulnerabilities and literally handed them a vulnerability assessment saying, here's your external risk right now. <laughs> I mean, they're yeah. getting to that point where the insurance organizations are hiring, you know, scan, they're, they're, they're bringing on scanning tools and companies, right? Yeah. And, 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 well, you see that happen uh, in the personal market, right? I mean, you yeah, plug in right. a little dongle to your ODP2 port on your car. And I, uh, you know, I was talking to somebody a year ago where I said, I, you know, I see this coming where you're going to, you know, if you want cyber insurance at anything mm -hmm. beyond a crazy rate or, you know, potentially even not being allowed to have it, you're going to have to have some type of insurance monitoring that's taking place, which yeah. I don't know how many companies are going to want to want to open that kimono. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the other side too, for anybody who's in the public sector, this happened, this happened recently in Rhode Island and I'm going to assume it's going to be a trend, but you know, here in the state, all of the municipalities and the local school districts and any, you know, public sector entity has this consortium. It's all about, it's all about economies of scale and saving money uh, on insurance. And it's called the trust. Well, about four weeks ago, every single municipality and every K through 12 school district got a letter from the trust saying we can no longer obtain cyber liability insurance. So in July, it's going to get dropped. We will fight for you to bring on another partner for cyber liability insurance. But here's a slew of things that you're going to have to comply with. And it was like a list of 20 items to even be considered if we can get a new company in July to provide cyber liability insurance. So, you know, think about that. Every municipality and every K through 12 school district this coming July, insurance is gone. Yeah. I knew this day of reckoning was going to come. Yes. Because yes. insurers make money. Like they're 100%. one of the most, right? It, it's all about They've been money. losing money. <laughs> They've been losing money. And, and <laughs> I, I can guarantee you, Matt, if we go back in time to some BSW that we've done in the past that had cyber liability insurance article in there, I can tell you that we predicted this. There's no doubt in my mind. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. We, we talked about it on Security and Compliance Weekly in the early days of yep. that show. Like We knew this was coming because I had spent enough time working with the insurers. Like you, It's just included. It's just a fee. It's all No, it's not going to stay that way. I, I think right. Marsh and a few of the insurers did a really good job of trying to get their arms around the control requirements they wanted to see before they would issue insurance. Yep. And I think some of the large providers did do a good job over the last few years really setting the tone for these are the things you're going to have to do. I think a lot of the other insurers were completely blindsided by ransomware and all these payouts and were not prepared. And so now right. you're seeing the ramifications of all that. It's, it's all well, the knee-jerk from the, them the losing their shorts. Goes, it goes back to the conversation we had. It's normalization. Like there's yeah. th there's the inability to respond in a normalized way where people can actually understand like the risk from org to org in a consistent framework, right? I mean, everybody reports in their own way. Their analysis of what whether the controls are effective or not is, is in their own way. It, it's very individualized and siloed. And again, scale. It's, it's a problem that doesn't scale, which is why you're seeing insurers not be able to cover the risks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't think there's been enough actuarial data to... to yeah. Like like we do in health insurance, like we do in car insurance, like Progressive made their money by not only showing their rates, but all their competitors' rates because they were using all the same actuarial tables to create these policies. We don't have that level of data and expertise in cyber yet. And until we get there, I don't know that you come up with a normalized standard yeah, cyber insurance exactly. policy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, article number two. Uh, managing the art and science of cybersecurity to be a successful CISO. <laughs> Here's some key attributes. Now, I, I thought these attributes were, were pretty interesting in, you know, yes, we all need to create value as leaders, whether you're in, in as a chief information security officer right. or not. Leaders have to create value. But the one that kind of threw me off was number four, top off your tech skills. Me because I'm too. not sure that's a requirement. <laughs> me too. That's the only one that I said, ah, yeah, no. <laughs> it's funny. We all aggregate you know, to mean, the same, same thing every time. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it's, it's, that that portion of it is is definitely not something that I would say uh, you know is 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 a requirement for the role. Be a good leader, you know. Hire hire good technical talent around you. Um, I mean, to some degree, yeah. Know what the market has and know what's out there. But 
there's no more hands to keyboard for us. We're, we're business leaders now, right? I mean, at yeah. the end of the day, we're fighting for this position to have a seat at the table. And if we're still clicking the keys on the keyboard, we're never going to be viewed that way. We're still going to be viewed as technologists, not as business leaders who help mitigate risk for the organization, who help bring cybersecurity best practices to the organization. You know, that, that one piece really threw me off. So yep, I'll, I'll add too. in one little contrary piece. So I thought I thought the first three were kind of table stakes for any leader, right? Yeah, like it just course. makes sense that you have to do those things. So take those off the list. The the fifth one, uh, become immersed in the business. I think that's something we talk about. And we echo all the time that it's super important to be actually understand the business you're trying to protect. Mm -hmm. The one thing I'll say about number four that I think is valuable is like don't be caught blindsided by changes in technology. So I think sure. that there are a lot of people in the IT and security side that kind of took a lazy fare approach to the transition to cloud. And as that happened, I think product in the CTO org really picked that up and kind of ran with it. And it's it's created a little bit of a schism there in some cases. And so I, I totally agree, Don't you don't need to be hands on keyboard, but I do think you need to keep yourself abreast of changing trends to make sure that sure. you're aligned with where the business wants to go, which then merges back into, you know, number five. 100% agree. But from a strategic perspective, right? I got, yeah. I don't yeah, want this totally. to be, I don't want this to be perceived and keep us in the technical rut that we've been labeled to be in. Right. So, so I just, again, it's, it's a balance, right? Yeah. You're so not going to look at it from a strategic perspective <laughs> and executive perspective. Yeah. Yeah. The okay. article we covered on Friday when you were out, Jason, is yeah. the, it was they made the case for why the CIO should report to the CISO because oh. if you think about that, let the CIO get have amen. the technical aspects. Right, exactly right, yeah. and and so you know if the CISO is truly the business leader that's managing the business risk from a security yeah. perspective, they don't need to be as technical if they have the right technical folks under them to manage the technical skill set right. that's needed. Right. So, but to yeah, but to Ben's to point, don't to don't be off in a cave, people. right? Don't be off in a cave and not know what's going on yeah. in the industry. Yeah, right. Yep, for sure. Uh, this next one: seven ways to ensure successful cross-team security initiatives. Which, look, I think this is the challenge for most security organizations. How can they work with other teams, other groups, mm -hmm. to work on these initiatives? We talk about DevOps and and security and this whole concept of DevSecOps, right? This has to happen at multiple places in the business, right? So I thought yes. this was a really good list of things that you need to really think about to create and ensure success around working with the other business units when mm -hmm. it comes to security. Um, thoughts on the list? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm big on ordering priorities. You know that, right? We've talked about this before. Yep. Number five be needs to become number one. Yeah. Trust, 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 trust. You have to build the relationships. You have to build the trust at every level of the organization. So it's not just at the C level. It's not just at the VP level. It's not just at the director level. It's making sure that your teams are engaged with the business at every level, building that trust. Be seen yeah. as someone who adds value to the business, who's there to be helping the business, and, and just be you know build that trust at every single angle. Because I'll tell you right now, you can have a good relationship at the C level, but you know when the when, when the users are saying we're not getting the right type of support, we're not getting the right type of of, of service levels, that'll start to bubble up like a volcano. And I think that's bi-directional, right? It, I think it's not just mm -hmm. trust the p you know learn how to um, get, get trust from other people, but it's also you have to trust your teams, right? I think yes. as people move up in the ranks, sometimes it's you know trying to maintain things too close to the vest not trusting your teams to be able to execute efficiently. And so I think that's one of the things that I would highlight about the trust quotient there is you've got to learn how to mm -hmm. trust your teams and the teams that you're working with to execute well. And then um, I like number three. I'm a big fan of races. Um, you know, find mm -hmm. out who's responsible, find out who's accountable, find out who's consulted and make sure that everybody knows those swim lanes. Cause that's, that's where I think things break down is people think they're responsible, but they're really not the responsible party. Right. <laughs> or people forget oh, to no, inform no, no. somebody who should have been informed. Right. Or multiple people think they're responsible, but only one should be responsible. So yes, <laughs> that's one right, right. Also, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I call it the scarecrow, scarecrow from the Wizard of Oz. You know how he points in multiple directions? Not me, exactly. but it's, you know, that way and that way. So yeah, no, exactly. ab absolutely. You know, clearly defining who's accountable and responsible for what activities is, is, is key. 
Now, on trust, that's why I pulled in article number four, because I, I, I'd seen this trend coming, and I'm like, yes, yeah, successful CISOs need to build trust. And so what are some of those things you need to do to build that trust? Now, I love the fact, I love you can't fake it, right? Because y- yeah. you you either, you're authentic or you're not, right? And you're never going to build trust if, if people don't really understand who you are. You can't put on a persona that is fake if you're ever going to attempt to build trust. And, it, you know, I've, I've you know, we've had these anecdotes before. Yep. Like trust is one of those foundational elements for me. I, I, I tell people, you'll love me or you'll hate me. But I'm always going to give it to you the same way, right? I, yeah, I, I, I don't try to pull any punches. I am I, what you see is what you get with me, right? Mm-hmm. To me, that is a way to build a level of trust because you're always going to get a consistent answer. You're always going to get a consistent view. You're not there to play the politics. That to me is just one of those core fundamental ways to earn trust, and yeah. I think it's so important because I look for that in my leaders, and I look for that in the people 100%. I hire and bring onto the team. You know, for, for that, I think the biggest thing that gets in the way that I've seen, at least through my experience, is ego. Ego gets in the way. And I've always said there's nothing wrong with bringing vulnerability to the table, right? Being able to explain, listen, this is not, you know, this isn't a place that I know a lot about or I'm well-versed in. It's okay, right? And it's okay to, to fall on your sword and ev- everybody makes mistakes. Nobody's perfect. And if you try to fake it and you try to bring that ego you're never going to be able to build good relationships. So, you know, throw the ego out the door. It's okay to be vulnerable and have those hard conversations. You know, uh, projects fail, initiatives fail, things happen. It's what you do with it after, right? Right. And how you make up for it after and how you change it to make sure it never happens again. Yep, exactly I'd extend right. that to be, you know, to, to the teams that you hire and the people you're bringing on, don't be afraid to bring people on who bring expertise and knowledge that surpasses your own, right? Absolutely. Um, I think sometimes I, I've seen leaders try to suppress that or, you know, not, mm-hmm. not hire the best people. And like, ultimately, like our job evolves outside and past that technology spectrum where you, you just can't know everything, right? So if you're not an expert in cloud, bring on a cloud expert, right? Who's really going to offer that advantage to the business. And I think that will make you look like a better leader in the outcome. If you're not versed in, you know, security operations, bring a guy who's, you know, awesome at running a SOC and running operations and threat intelligence. Like it it doesn't look bad when you bring on people who are better. It looks bad when you bring on people who aren't up to the task and you're left with the gap. That's right. That's right. And Ben, yeah, you know, I always say, I probably said it on the show before at this point in my career, I'm the conductor of the orchestra. I'm not the best violinist. I'm not the best cellist. I'm not the best musician anymore. But what I can do is I can take that great talent and make some beautiful music together. That's my strength. Yeah. Well said. Right. And you've built the trust with your leadership and with your team to continue to be a great um, conductor, Jason. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all right this next article i had to pull it in for you because you've done work with with uh langevin we've had yeah. him on the show we've interviewed him um yep. on uh, i think it was on paul security weekly we interviewed him last year like so two congressmen uh, Jim Langevin uh, and John Katko from New York are not seeking re-election. And, and I think this is a little bit of a hit. We talk about the need to bring some consistency at the federal level around yeah. things like security and privacy. How big of a hit is this in moving uh, some stuff forward at the federal level? I'll tell you right now, just hearing you kind of lead this article in, I got goosebumps on my arms when you when you started saying that because we are losing one of the OG evangelists for cybersecurity in Washington DC and and it makes me sad it really does because you know I, you're talking about a congressman who's been there for 22 years has a ton of experience and has always had cybersecurity at the forefront you know back in the day when it wasn't cool to be talking about cybersecurity he, you know, he started the cybersecurity caucus because he knew this was going to be an issue. He knew it was a national defense issue. And, and, and just to have someone who had that level of foresight and, and really push it at every angle to the point where he was, you know, he was one of the, the largest proponents to start 
uh, the, the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, right? Which, which in turn gave leadership to, uh, you know, to cybersecurity in the administration. I, you know, it's, we're losing such high value cybersecurity talent, evangelist, uh, you know, a legislator who knows what they're talking about, who really has the best interest uh, of this country and cybersecurity at heart. I, I, like I said, I, I have goosebumps because there's a big hole that's going to be there in, in DC now. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm just waiting for you to announce your election campaign to fill a seat. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Albuquerque 2024. <laughs> there you go. But I think, but this is interesting to me in that two key congressmen who have pushed mm-hmm. this. Now there's a gap. Like, do we just lose all of our momentum that we were finally starting to gain in D.C.? And it's like, where do other cybersecurity leaders? come yeah. in to help fill some of those gaps at the national level, I, you know, it, it is a shame. That's why I brought this article in here is because yeah. what does this do to the executive order and other momentum we had already started in 2021 20, yep. and 22? And, and does that put the brakes on it and we still don't get to where we need to be as an industry? That, that's my big right. concern. Right. You know, and, and, and you know, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in um, influencing politics by being involved. I was on the congressman's advisory committee uh, for cybersecurity here in Rhode Island. Um, get get involved. Reach out to your congressmen and senators. As 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 leaders in cybersecurity, it's our job to influence them. We vote them in, right? I mean, ultimately, it's our vote that helps them get elected. Leverage your talent. Leverage your knowledge. Leverage you know. Leverage a relationship between a constituent and a politician, because remember, they're here to serve us. And if we can get involved, if we can start influencing, we're going to be in a better spot. It's up to us. It really is. It's up to us to influence. If the void is going to be there, if we allow it to be there, start educating our senators and congressmen, right? Offer up time to have some town halls where you can bring, you know, cybersecurity uh, subject matter experts to the table in your state and meet with these congressmen and meet with these senators, educate them. Agreed. Uh, Two big losses there. Uh, This next article, why employees violate cybersecurity policies. You know, this is HBR article and they did some research here and I Mm -hmm. thought it was interesting because, you know, we talk about this a lot. You know, the the weakest link is the human. We, We click on the link, we violate the policy, but why do we do it? And this article basically boils down to says, you know, it suggests that much of the time failures to comply may actually be the result of intentional yet not malicious violations largely driven by employee stress. And I think that's interesting when we think about the culture we want to create. Creating a cybersecurity culture without creating stress because it's the stress element that seems to be the reason these policies get violated. So why don't we create a culture of less stress? Maybe that improves our overall cybersecurity uh, uh, mm-hmm. posture and policies because people aren't stressed out and feel that they need to violate the policies. It's just, it's right. just an interesting way to think about the problem. Yeah, I, but let's, I, let's, I, let's take a step back, though, and define why our workforces are stressed. They're stressed because they're trying to get their job done, right? And mm-hmm. it's not easy to get their job done. There's hurdles and roadblocks and places they could trip. It's not, it's not as easy for them to get the job done that they need to get done in the time, you know, in the time that they're, they're, they, they have this pressure to get it done in. So I, I think there's stress a couple of is things misplaced. That, I, I don't think stress is the right word. I, I use the word friction. To, sure. to the yeah, point you're that, making, that's a great, that's a great like, word as well, right? But, people are but, trying to accomplish their daily job, which they're on the hook for their, you know, OKRs and getting paid. And, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're on pressure from their boss and they've got projects to do. If you produce friction that makes it harder to get that done, you're, you're in the line of sight to where they're going to try to figure out how to go around you. Yeah. And so but I it, think it becomes a, stress, though, Ben. I mean, it, it will become stress. That, that generates think, it, right? Think, but yeah, that generates the stress. It'll generate the stress, right? Because ultimately, they're under a timeline. Let's say you're a, sa- a sales executive and you have quotas to meet and you're, you know, your sales director is down your throat. And, and you, you, know, you basically figure out, I can probably get more done by building my own CRM out in the cloud, and I'll just pay $25 an hour, uh, $25 a month 
to have my own CRM and I'll manage my own customers outside of the corporate CRM. Think about that, right? Mm -hmm. That stuff happens. That means they don't have the tools available to them or they're so cumbersome, they can't do their jobs. But now what happens? Now you have customer information in shadow IT in a separate CRM somewhere else where we don't have oversight on that. And what are salespeople keeping in those CRMs? Birthdays, wife's, you know, the, the wife or the husband of their customers' birthdays, their kids' birthdays. It's all of this intelligence about their client that they're keeping. And a lot of times it's PII, right? It's personal information about them because they right. want to send a card on their birthday. They want to, you know, have that personal relationship. But because they can't get their job done and the user experience has so many roadblocks in friction to your point, Ben. They're going off and they're firing up shadow IT. Yep. Yeah. And that, that's where this, I think when you when we implement policy, we need to look at it from a friction standpoint and determine like what are the unintended consequences and how am mm-hmm. I impacting, you know, the, the the livelihood of the people that we're trying to implement controls on. So yeah, sure, you're trying to prevent data from exfiltrating the company, but you, you know, hot glue the USB port and somebody goes to do a sales presentation at a customer site and can't connect to the projector or something. Well, that's a problem, right? Like you've just yeah. impacted them greatly. And so they're going to be frustrated. They're going to be aggravated. You're going to raise that stress level. Mm-hmm. And I, I really think we need to think about this from the more human side of cyber and, and how what we're doing could be done in a potentially better way with less friction. Yep. That's it. There's a great paragraph in here that sums this up. It says managers must recognize that job design and cybersecurity are fundamentally intertwined. The reality is that compliance with cybersecurity policies can add to employees' workloads, and so it should be considered and incentivized That's alongside right. other performance metrics when workloads are determined. So yeah, I, I think 100%. that's super critical, Matt. Like when 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 I looked at how in, in past lives at companies, we were creating objectives and incentives for people, take operations. It's always incentivized on uptime, right? And when you think about security, when you try to do patching and, and maintenance, there's always an impact to uptime. So if you incentivize that operations team solely on uptime, they're never going to want to fix anything. But if you create incentives that say uptime combined with uh, you know security hygiene, all of a sudden now they're incentivized to do the behavior you're asking. And so again, back to a human side, what is the outcome we're trying to achieve? And let's make sure we're aligning the business goals to those achievable outcomes. Yeah. You want to know what a good metric is? User experience. Who would have thought in, in cybersecurity? UX. Yeah. yeah. Throw a yeah. user experience metric in there. Now, now the team has the behaviors that they know they need to go down. Number one, if somebody calls, calls the team because they're having an issue, the customer service is going to be incredible. They're going to be baking in user experience metrics and criteria for success of a project. User experience, customer service, bring it. Yeah. So you brought up something interesting that's going to tie into this last article, Ben, which is you talked about uptime versus cyber hygiene. So 20 years ago, Gates came out with his trustworthy computing memo. And the, the thing I want to read here, because I think this is so interesting on where we are still and, and have not made practice, his closing remarks in this memo was, going forward, we must develop technologies and policies that help businesses better manage ever larger networks of PCs, servers, and other intelligence devices, devices knowing that their critical business systems are safe from harm. Systems will have to become self-managing and inherently resilient. We need to prepare now for a kind of software that will make this happen. And we must be the kind of company that people can rely on to deliver it. It was 20 years ago. We're not there yet. No, yeah, we're not. Uh, it's the journey, not the destination. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 will say, I will say the shift to cloud is, is making it happen faster, I guess you could say. Mm. Uh, because think about it, think about it now, right? So my M365 instance, I'm not super worried about that being patched with an outage window and a change yep. management window because it's happening, right? So the more and more I migrate, you know, service delivery automation suite, I'm not super concerned with having to have those change management windows to patch it because it's all up in the cloud. CRM yep. system, same way. So we're getting there. We're just not, we're not fully there yet. And, and to the credit of Microsoft, look, they've made a huge amount of improvement. Huge. I mean, if yeah. you think about where we were with Patch Tuesdays back in 
2008, 2009 to where right. we are today. They have made a lot of progress, but we've still mm -hmm. never gotten to the concept of fully trustworthy computing systems yet where yeah. you know, we, we don't have to worry about them on but, a day-to-day -day basis. I, mean, I guess here's the, here's the question though, Matt. Like, will we ever, because here's the thing, right? So if I still have services running off of a Windows server, whether it's in Azure or it's on-prem, I'm still going to have to, I, I don't want my manufacturer patching that without me running it through its paces first, because maybe the operating system will be fine, but maybe the applications that are running on it won't be. So, so, I'll, and those are my been applications. The rub. I know. So, so, you know, I, I think there's a balance there where, you know, I don't want it to be fully autonomous because you could be literally frying one of my applications with one patch. I want to test it first. I want to make sure yeah. we're going through that change management exercise. So yeah, that way my services won't be down don't on Monday morning. Be because of your previous experience, because of what you've seen gone wrong, right? I mean, I think that that's the method that needs to change. Is And, and I agree with you. It's, it's not a short path to get there. But I think there needs to be a different expectation of the way the interaction between products happen and the way software works, right? I mean you know, conceivably you can get an over, uh, over the air update to your car and it doesn't affect like, you know, the size of the cargo bay, right? Like whether I can put a box that's a certain size in the back of my Tahoe, it's the same size box tomorrow, right? You're not going to physically change the functionality there. So I, I think, I think the expectation of what's being delivered and how they're intertwined and what <clears throat> the boundaries of that, yeah, that's somewhat what's changing in a cloud delivered model, right? It's it's very standardized and getting away from that. Everything's a one off. Yeah, yeah. I, it's funny that you mentioned automobiles, right? No, I, I get it. It's not going to change the physical side of it. But if I put a custom head unit in my in my truck because I want my stereo, I want my AV system in there, a, a patch from the manufacturer could totally blow that up. <laughs> yeah, but that's why you can't put a custom head unit in your car anymore because almost everything well. <laughs> runs through the head unit. Like, that's 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 so my much. point in its entirety. Like everything can't be a one-off, or you you get what you expect, right? It's everything's a one-off. Everything has to be tested. So that, I yeah, think um, validating both of our points there. <laughs> no, no, totally. But I, I, will we ever get to the point? And and I have customers who do this, who literally because there's nothing on the market to be able to solve for their business need have 100% soup to nuts custom dev product, right? Yeah. Custom development. Mm -hmm. How do you expect them? I mean, you can't get away from it. There's nothing on the market that's going to serve them, right? I right. know I, I have three companies off the top of my head who are customers of but, right now. But think about the components they're using to build those custom applications. Now, mm -hmm. this is where we've seen the shift around the open source side of the world is because now I can take these components that might be trusted and might not be trusted. Uh, I'll give you that. But how do I use these trusted open source components to actually mm. build a custom piece of software? So we have moved a little bit in that direction versus a proprietary lock system, potentially, Jason. So, sure. you know, sure. we have made some progress here. Yeah, we're not there where I would 100% right. trust autonomous patching on it. Right. I agree. <laughs> Jason, just give it another 100 years and we'll be fine. <laughs> And we also realize that Car Toys has no business in audio anymore in in in, in the in automotive industry because it's going to blow up your car. So, very true. You know, I come General, from the old school where I used to have Beats in my trunk. Come on, yeah. <laughs> right. no, I, I, I know, I, I did too. So, gentlemen, always a pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening, and we'll see you next week on Business Security Weekly. <laughs>